Hi, I'm uh, Mark Yang, and I'm here with the leaders of the church in Ottawa, Tony and Melanie Singh. They're great friends of mine. I've known them from uh, their time when they used to lead the church in Toronto, as well as uh, lead the church in Chicago. But they've also led ministries in Los Angeles and Boston, and uh, spent some time out of the ministry in San Antonio. I wanted to start off by asking uh, them both, uh, can you give us, uh, tell us a little bit about the story of how you became a Christian? Great, I became a Christian in 1986 while I was a student at the University of Toronto. Uh, my best friend in high school, God worked uh, incredibly, formed a relationship and brought us together in high school. Little did I know yeah. that he was bringing us together. And then when he went off to college and I was a student at the same college, we uh, started studying the Bible and uh, therefore became a Christian back in 1986. Prior to you becoming a Christian, did you think you were a Christian? Yes. Okay. I, abs I As a matter of fact, I thought I was doing uh, Clovis and Henry a favor. I said, oh, these guys are Christian <laughs> people, so I'll help them feel useful in their Christianity. Right. And then you studied and realized you weren't. So I realized that, hey, wait a minute. The idea of being a Christian was very attractive to me. Living out the Christianity, that was a different thing altogether. And I realized the hypocrisy in my life and, and to realize God's word is meant to be obeyed and not just believed. I got you. Uh, Melanie, you have a, a, a unique story too. You were uh, yep. you studied the Bible and became a Christian as a single mom. Uh, yep. yeah, tell us your story. So I was 21 when I became a Christian. My son was 18 months and uh, um, my older brother had started coming to the Toronto Church of Christ and we grew up Catholic. Uh, so he would he was going to a church that we considered, or what we called a clap clap church, which was very um, enthusiastic and uh, all outward. Um, and so um, what I saw in my brother is I saw a change in who he was and I saw a change in his character and I was too proud to ask him what was going on in his life, but he had invited me to church. Um, I studied the Bible but in studying the Bible, I learned that uh, part of your conversion process is to talk about your past, to talk about your sin, and I wanted no part of that because, quite frankly, I was ashamed. And the truth of the matter is, I believed that if people knew who I really was, then they wouldn't love me and they'd look at me differently. And I sort of prided myself on being different on the outside than I really was on the inside. And so I stopped studying the Bible and I walked away for about four or five months and God really humbled me during that time, um, truly. I mean, I, I, uh, it was a dark, dark time in my life. And I remember uh, one particular night where I said, God, if there's still a way back to you, um, then please show me. And if there's not, then take my life. So it was pretty intense. Um, I woke up the next morning, there was a note under my door uh, my brother was like, please come to this conference. And uh, I rushed out of the room and I was like, I'm coming. Um, unbeknownst to me, people were praying for me. And anyways, I went to the conference and seven days later I got baptized. Wow. <laughs> that was 1989. Right. So. And that decision still lasted, obviously. That's right. It wasn't just That's hype, right. but obviously conviction. That's right. uh, one of the things I wanted to ask about was your time actually out of the ministry, but still... Uh, involved in God's kingdom, helping people become Christians. In San Antonio, you guys led like a house church, uh, and uh, you saw some people become Christians uh, and were effective. Uh, can I ask you, Tony, uh, and then Melanie, what were some of the things that you guys did as house church leaders uh, to help reach out to people that, that, that helped you guys be effective? Well, one of the things is that in our group, there were a lot of families that had children who were teenagers. And, and so we realized that's not the same as a singles group or a campus group or even a group with, uh, with empty nesters. Mm -hmm. And so what we realized is that we need to make sure that these kids' needs are being met. And so honestly, what we did is the Texas thing, which is Friday nights uh, in our family group, we would go to the football games and see the, the marching band. The Texas thing. Yes, absolutely. Yes, and so uh, honestly, we just, we didn't meet in, in, during the week because of people's schedules. We yeah. met on a Friday night and sometimes Sunday after church we would meet together as a family group. And honestly, that developed into the point where uh, there were a number of people who became Christians, who got baptized, uh, a total from, the, from those families, six people, and then 
there were two people who were uh, restored uh, into the fellowship just in about a 14 month period. And, and that's not because uh, we were so great. I think it's because there were some needs. We tried to meet the needs yeah. and God just said, amen. These people are now ready to become a part of the family. Right. And yeah. it's been awesome since, honestly, we've had a couple more phone calls where people from yeah. that uh, circle of influence even have surrendered their lives to Christ. So, yeah. so you didn't just do the formula thing now, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. no, I, I think, you know, when we looked at the group, a lot of the parents, um, they were really focused on their kids for different reasons. Um, and we felt like, you know, there's a short period of time where you have your teens with you, then they're gone. And, you know, then the world really does have this exponential opportunity to attack them. And so, we're like, we could go out and door knock or we could help these people that are right here in our midst. And so even our Bible talks where if we didn't have football games or different things, it was volleyball in the park, barbecues together. So everything we did included the whole family. Um, you know, sometimes parents of, of the disciples would come because it was always a family affair. So it wasn't weird then when we would be sitting down with the parents in the living room having a counseling appointment. Kids knew who we were. So when they did open up their hearts to God to study the Bible with them, wasn't like we needed to go find somebody mm. or, oh, let me ask this person because they're mature. It was, oh, it's Tony and Melanie. They're in our group. We're a family. And so I think that's kind of the theme. It, it's, it was meeting people where they're at and then building that sense of family in the group um, together. So. Amen. I want to ask about some of the, the great things that God's doing uh, in Ottawa and maybe some of the attitudes or approaches you guys have taken. Obviously, we know it's all God. Yeah. It's always God. Uh, but but maybe there's a something you can share in regards to either like an attitude or an approach you've taken to, to allow God to work. And, you know, we, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes our bad attitudes can stop God. So uh, God's doing great things. Uh, what do you have to share about what, what what's helped you kind of be along for that ride? Well, the, the amazing thing is that um, I realized that God is not a formula and he's not a code to figure out. And when I had a lot, of, I've gone to some other congregations and I had a plan. And the truth is, I realized I'm going to try and not have a predetermined plan. And one of the things that I learned perhaps more than anything outside when I was not in the ministry for about oh five years is that this thing is much bigger than me it's about God and so what we did from an approach vantage point uh, we were excited not repulsed but excited by gra about grassroots ministries yeah and uh, what uh, what do I mean by grassroots ministries we were we we're involved in setting up the facility we're involved in bringing coffee. We're inv involved in people's lives yeah. at a very intimate level. And then we said, without a doubt, we are going to just focus on God and not our problems. Right. Yeah. Not that the problems aren't don't need to be dealt with, but we're going to start first things first. Mm -hmm. Let's focus on yeah. God and bring God into the picture so that when we do talk about our problems, we actually have a way and a solution and the faith to fix it. And so right. uh, in, in, a, in a real brief sense, that's what I would say. Great yeah. grassroots ministry. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, as Tony was sharing, we, we had gone into other ministries with, you know, sort of a program and a schedule. And one thing that Tony did that was faith inspiring for me was um, right before we moved, he used to keep sort of boxes of all of his sermons and all of his classes and date you know each one with where he taught and where he taught it and he threw them out <laughs> and when he did it I was like what are you doing um, but but I think it was a faith move it was like God you started this process moving us and so you're moving us into a new stage in our life in a new church and so you're gonna have to show us what you want us to do and I think that's what God did you know we went in very very inspired by what God had been doing in our lives. And then, so we went there very inspired. And a small thing like getting with each disciple and having dinner with them, I think even opened up more the direction God wanted us to go. And so started out talking about God, but then he, he transitioned to a series on the epic battles. And it really was not, it was the focus on how God used ordinary people, broken people, 
to do extraordinary things. And, and, you know, just helping people to see sometimes we think we have to be here before God's going to use us. And maybe that's why he's using them because they're so awesome. Mm -hmm. But no, God, God's going to use you because God wants to use you because God has a plan and God has a story. Well, can I add one more thing as well? I think it was really important before I went to Ottawa. I asked a number of people, hey, what would you do? Mm. And I think that was an important part of that step in terms of trying to figure out what should our approach be um, in regard to uh, heading into Ottawa. Amen, challenging. So our last question here is, obviously you guys have been in the ministry for, for decades. Uh, actually, I uh, was part, of, trained under them for about five years, uh, five, six years, so it was a great time. Uh, you had to, to articulate, I'm sure a lot of things have changed since then, but it's not like you guys were dummies 20 years ago. You know, you led successful and large ministry. But uh, yet you've still grown. You've still evolved in your leadership and your approach to God and ministry. Uh, today, uh, you know, you can check on our website. Tony preached a lesson on, you know, uh, just having a, a God story, a big God, and, and worshiping the, uh, the God of Abraham and not being so focused on the Abraham of God. Um, again, I'm sure there's so many different things. But in terms, again, of approach or attitude, how do you view ministry different today than you did 10, 20 years ago? Well, let me use this analogy. The day I got married to Melanie about 28 years ago, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody loved their their wife as much as I loved mine. Mm -hmm. At least not more. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> in other words, I was madly, <laughs> deeply, deeply, truly in love yeah. with her. <laughs> However, 28 years later, I can say I love my wife more today than I did back then. Because I know how to love her better. And mm. that's not an indictment yeah. on 28 years ago. It's actually an incredible growth, at least for me, knowing how to love. Same thing with ministry. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, uh, man, I absolutely in love my time uh, under the Mancinis, under the Eastmans, under the Fuquay. I mean, there's the Fuquays. Just so, so many people inspired under the McKeans that I was inspired in my yeah. faith. But to, to summarize, what I have realized perhaps more than ever, especially when I got out of the ministry and was sitting in the pews for about five years, is this. It is really important at this age in my life, and right now I'm 52 years old. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do with myself in this fellowship? And at least for me, I realize I want to be useful and how do I how do I get to be useful mm. so one thing that I was not going to rely on others for their spirit for my spiritual de development yeah. all the resources of me learning about God is right there at my fingertips online I can learn so there was a, a still a sense yeah. of continually learning about God and honestly what I discovered is God is incredibly huge yeah he's massive and powerful and if we but trust him and one of the recurring things that i said today uh and in our time together trust the story yeah and what that means is put my faith in this trusting in this god that is very worthy of our trust and so yeah. honestly that is what has happened and i realize more than ever it's not about me hmm. yeah it's about be, me being an instrument to be used by God, but it's only that, an instrument. Yeah. It's ultimately about God. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Melanie, how about you, your approach or your view of God and ministry now from 10, 20 years ago? <laughs> um, I think, and it may be the size of the group we're leading, I, I don't know that it is or isn't, but um, I think it's the idea of instead of I'm a minister, it's I'm here to minister to people. And, you know, I, I, Tony and I have been reading this, listening to this podcast, and the guy said something that really sort of crystallized for me what, what I feel like the big difference is. Um, I think when I looked at my history or our history in our churches, I, I looked sometimes at the past and I was, and I thought, man, we did a lot of things wrong, right? Um, and so, you know, now I want to correct what is right, or I'm coming back into the ministry to correct what is right. And the truth is, it wasn't that that was wrong and this is right. It was 
that was where we were mm. and that was the faith we had and now this is where i am and this is the faith i have so it's not wrong it's just now it's more true yeah. so that was true what we did and how we acted is it was true to us is what we did we believed it and we and god did amazing things Absolutely. through that faith but now 30 years later there's more truth of God that we've learned. And so we're leading out of that greater truth. And hopefully 10 years from now, it'll be greater truth because we've learned more from God. All right, well, that's it. Well, before we sign off, okay. uh, I was gonna, we always like to kind of ask people if there's a book they're reading or that they could recommend in the last five years or something like that, just for our readers to, or viewers to kind of you know check out a book or anything. So I don't know if you guys have a book recommendation that kind of spurred it on or anything in the last five years. <laughs> Uh, that's encouraged you or anything, uh, Tony or Melanie? But well, here's what I do, Mark. Yeah. That yeah. I actually really want to read things that I don't agree with. Mm. Okay. Uh, and what I mean by that, I want to be, at this stage in my life, I want to be intellectually challenged. Not only spiritually challenged. I think I will always be spiritually challenged. Mm -hmm. But I want to be intellectually yeah. challenged. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so here are some of the things that intellectually challenge. There is a podcast that we listen to that's called Bima. Okay, that, that that really challenges me. Yeah. I I read uh, John Piper. I read John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are some th guys that I don't agree with everything that they say, but it absolutely helps me. Yeah. Uh, Tim Keller, for yeah. example. They, yes. they, they challenge you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so both the podcast has been a really great help. But uh, there was a book when we were in San Antonio. A friend of ours, Dave Pocto, is going to school to get his PhD and he recommended a book called Spiritual Formation. Mm. It's just very different than the idea of the spirit that I have grown up learning. And so it, it caused me to look, I think, at the spirit and how God works in a different way than I, I'm used to looking at it. And so it sort of broadened my horizons and led us to all these other avenues of looking at God and looking at the kingdom. So. Awesome. Well, this is uh, Mark Kane from Detroit Church signing off. Thank you guys and hope you enjoyed. Thank you for thank having you. us. By the way, thank you so much for yeah. having us. Thank you. Thank you for us believing, uh, believing in us. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and I'm eternally grateful. Amen. <laughs>